Hello. Uh, today, we're happy to present Bill Baron Mickle uh, to you all, and um, excited to have Bill's work in our upcoming September exhibition that we're calling Essential, um, which has work by 13 different artists, all uh, dealing with questions of what is essential related to food and sustenance and other concerns. Um, my name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm executive director of Bainbridge Arts and Crafts, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today, Bill. I'm going to turn it over to you, and if you could give us a bit of your background. All right. Hi. Uh, nice to be here. Um, I have a fairly long career at this point. Um, I started in high school, basically, and went on through BFA and an MFA um, and an MA after that. But um, it's always been around metals, um, jewelry and then silversmithing. Uh, as I kept learning about myself and what I liked or didn't like about the processes or the look of what I was making um, and kept changing. And I do think that that's part of my essential um, art life is I always seem to be changing. Um, and uh, that makes it more satisfying for me as I go along. Um, but it's made it hard in terms of uh, always pinpointing what I do. Um, I started as a jeweler, uh, casting and then forging and, and smithing the, the small of uh, brooches and, and, and uh, things like that. I did forge a ring that I loved and that sort of told me I really loved forging, um, but that's a very, very minute uh, operation. Um, and a lot of that was uh, pointed me towards silversmithing. And so I then went back to school, uh, undergrad, uh, sorry, uh, from undergrad to graduate school to study with a very uh, well-known silversmith, Hans Christensen, at uh, the School for American Craftsmen in Rochester, New York. So um, I wanted to learn beyond what I had figured out on my own with a great set of tools that uh, California College of Arts and Crafts had uh, available to us, but no instructor that sh could show us at that time how to use them. So I was somewhat self-taught initially, and then I wanted a, a strong understanding of how to, to form metal raising, planishing, all the processes that would go into fine metals. And he was fantastic, um, but he was also paired with another professor that was really out there in terms of wanting to each of the students to reach for what uh, was personally meaningful rather than a product and a design of what poured well and you know all of that so yes I did make ladles and wine cups and uh, coffee um, servers but uh, I kind of took that understanding and love of forming into the other realm where I needed to have personal uh, meaning in the works themselves. So Who was that I, other professor? The other professor was um, Gary Griffin, mm -hmm. who taught at, there for quite a number of years and then at Cranbrook Academy of Art where he, he finished his career for the last, I don't know, another 20 years, who knows, I forget. Um, but uh, he, 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 he really, wanted his students to to press the boundaries of things. So um, my thesis work was probably not great because you are pushing boundaries and you don't have a good control over what you're doing. Um, but over time, um, you know, you try different things. So I, I went to craft fairs. I, I did some sort of in-between things where I did a lot of landscape type of work that were in vase forms, uh, in uh, in, in low bowl forms um, and they had uh, nice landscape uh, effects uh, with uh, mixed, what I, what I think I termed a long time ago was mixed metals. It's common to use that term now. But when I was becoming a silversmith, the market was um, captured by the Hunt Brothers in Texas and my $5 an ounce silver became $50 an ounce silver. And you need a lot of ounces to make a coffee pot. And <laughs> so it became an unaffordable sort of uh, prospect to continue into silversmithing. But the brass and copper and even nickel all work the same 
with slightly different uh, give and take on, on uh, how flexible they are when you're, you're, you're forming them. And they can all join together with the same solders, um, same hot processes. So um, I just started using all of them as accents here and there, what, you know, the, I usually use brass and, um, and then add copper touches or nickel if I want something whitish, grayish, sometimes sterling. Um, a lot of my wall pieces do use sterling or even fine silver so that they won't tarnish over time. And I uh, use very low, uh, low risk factor patinas to color the metal. Um, so that I'm saving my own health. Um, it, there's also some laziness in there because you have to be a little chemist to uh, mix some of the other chemicals to get the more exciting uh, patinas on metal. And you risk more uh, in the process of fuming and uh, just uh, being around them. So I, I tended to use colors that uh, were natural over time to that particular metal. So certain greens and reds, uh, copper has some beautiful oranges as well um, that you can get that if you left the piece and didn't attend to it, or you couldn't, because it's out there somewhere, it would, it, and that surface came off, it would eventually return to that surface, most probably uh, in its natural coloring over time, oxidation. Just a general question, is there more available in terms of quote unquote safe chemicals now than maybe when you were first starting out or has it not changed very much in that way? Well, the, the, the main chemical that's used in a, in a metal studio would be something we call pickle, which used to be something along the lines of a sulfuric acid. Um, so in, when I started in undergraduate, that is what we used and um, it would spatter if you're impatient and throwing the hot piece into uh, the pickle a little too soon, it might spatter on your clothes, which you might not notice until you wash your clothes and then you see little holes appearing in your clothes. But by the end of that, or at least by the beginning of um, uh, my graduate program, they do have a synthetic pickle that won't do that, that will clean your work uh, pretty much the same. Um, efficiency as the original. But as far as the other fumes uh, for patination, I don't know that, that it is um, particularly safe um, to do. Um, maybe the amount that we do, because I don't produce all that much in a year, it's a very labor intensive uh, type of work that I do. Um, it wouldn't be that damaging if I did it occasionally. So I don't know, or with good ventilation. But part of it is you also have to know how to store them in between all that time, there's shelf life to things like liver of sulfur. And if you're using true liver of sulfur, um, there is a shelf life to what uh, you can use and have it actually do what you want. So I never kept up with that part of the, the field, I think. I do think it's really wonderful the way that you're using the natural colors of the metals that you're combining to kind of paint your imagery with in a way, maybe paint's not the best word, but um, I'm looking at the piece on the wall behind you and um, you've got brass and copper and nickel, I believe in that. And they're all chosen for the color and contrast that they provide. C contrast largely, and then sometimes color so that you can try and bring in, the, that's a picture um, not picture, that's a, a, a deep wall relief um, that's formed and fabricated as a, as a it's, it's still in the sculpture realm, um, deep relief, uh, and it shows the back deck of my house. Um, <laughs> that was a series I did called Busy Lives uh, and that led into another one called Gestures, which kind of overlap a little bit, but they, um, they I needed some humor and I needed a different type of work. And, and this type of piece, uh, especially in the metal framed ones, um, I needed to, to change up how I worked from the three dimensional to the deep um, two dimensional sort of image. Um, and I had kids, I was a very involved parent and things were, my, my idea was to take scenes that you might see in a painting that are usually very 
lovely and everything's put away and there's a little cup over there. But in my version <laughs> with family and um, loving being a parent, you'll, you'll see uh, there's a, a work in the a museum called uh, Couch and there's a, a bit of a shoe underneath the couch. There's also um, <laughs> some things left out on the table or uh, the, the Afghan that would traditionally be maybe folded over the, the, uh, the couch itself is flipped up. And, you know, it's a little ruffled. Um, and in, in this one, a bird is stealing bread off of the table um, because crows are tricksters and I love birds and have made a number of birds in my pieces. Um, doing um, things like that. Um, so, so anyway, that was a, to switch up the seriousness and how long it takes to do a three-dimensional work in, in metal smithing, because there's an understructure that you have to think about deeply before you, you finish off the tops. You know, the, 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 basically the skin of it is what you see, but underneath it has to be strong enough to withstand shipping and handling um, and not collapse. Um, or shift or dent. So there is a, a structure underneath all of the three dimensional ones that I've made. Um, and this was just to be much more free, uh, free formed literally with uh, their design, um, letting them build as they go rather than having to plot everything out in advance. Piece you described, it's in the collection of the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art, is that right? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, the uh, I, I've tried a number of things. I, I did ACE craft fairs, the American Craft oh. Enterprise craft fairs, and the very first Smithsonian craft fair, which was attractive because one, it's the Smithsonian, and two, it only had 100 exhibitors. And um, so the competition to be in there was, uh, it was an honor to be in there. And you got to drive right down into the center of Washington, D.C. and unload your little hatchback with, with all of your work and pedestals and everything crammed in there. And then, um, you know, we re receive uh, the, the audience over the week. It's still um, but, limited to only a hundred artists. It's, it's still got that prestige. <laughs> oh, good. Uh, it's, it's, I like that because the ACE craft fairs, I, I was in it the year after Woodstock. I think that was the name of the original, original one um, that was in Woodstock, New York, and they had just moved to a bigger venue in Boston or outside Boston, uh, West Springfield actually is what it was. And it's basically one of those large uh, county fair sort of situations where the two years that I did it, they bumped up by hundreds and hundreds each time. And it was just too much for me, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm not kind of, I'm definitely an introvert. So those days were very difficult for me, um, although exciting to be there. Um, but you're also with literally up to 600 other people and that's just uh, too much. Um, so I got out of that and went back to just sending things out to galleries uh, when there were calls or approaching galleries. I did have a gallery in Rochester um, and did my own work. I learned a lot in that process with friends that were doing jewelry where galleries were looking for specific types of things or colors of things or, you know, and I realized that I'm not open to that kind of suggestion unless it's a commission where I'm really talking to someone about, you know, what's, what they like about my work and a, an element or two that they would like to have in, in a piece of mine to do those same shows that you describe. Mm -hmm. I remember West Springfield and the smell of manure, <laughs> actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Cow Palace, I was going to say earlier, but. <laughs> um, and it, it's a challenging way to make a living, certainly, but a lot of people do it. Um, yeah. And those are decisions I had to come to. You know, I, I did have gallery shows um, right out of uh, undergraduate college. I was going to, uh, I was thinking back, I'm going through a lot of old work now as I'm uh, changing my storage systems. And I thought I should take a look at the condition and, and whatnot of old pieces. And I'm reminded of how we used to only use slides and send those out. But even with slides at the time I was graduating uh, in 78, I think it was, 
um, you literally were supposed to take your portfolio to the galleries that you had picked out that might, you, you have already scouted out their possible appropriateness for your work. And you literally approached them somewhat cold, somewhat like, oh, can I drop by? And um, I can only imagine they're inundated these days with so many more people. But um, I did come away with two shows in New York that um, had a New York gallery as well as a suburban um, setting like in Greenwich or something like that. And I spent a year making jewelry for one of them. Um, that was the Aaron Faber gallery and uh, metalsmithing for the other one, which was the Elements gallery. Um, I think maybe only the Aaron Faber one might exist now. I think the Elements might have run its course with its owners, founders. But, um, and that's when I had decided to go back to graduate school and, and really kind of change it because um, I had wanted to, I had prototypes of like wine cups and I had them exhibited down in New York. And I was, I found myself very nervous that someone might actually like them enough to order a set of 12. And then I would have to make 12 that were almost identical. And I realized that personally that didn't do it for me. I, I needed to do, I like short series where I have an idea and I can evolve the idea a little bit, but making the same piece over and over again for potentially years just really uh, didn't sit well with me and I needed to make some changes. So I found other work, I taught for a while and I worked for a company for a while and a foundation for a long while. Mm -hmm. um, while I also um, continued to do my own work and slip in writing about um, metal smithing and jewelry um, for metalsmith. Uh, I have a piece or two that were in uh, Sculpture magazine and uh, American Craft and my earliest one in Ornament magazine. So I did that for, for a good while for also some extra uh, interest for me. It was also a way for me to meet people in my field. Yeah, it gives you permission to ask all kinds of questions, doesn't it? And it learn. does, and to share, you know, experiences with someone who has some experiences. Mm -hmm. um, now, you studied similar. art history as well, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you there. Um, no, um, does that play into the way you approach your subject matter when you're making work? Do you Probably, in not necessarily a great way. Um, sometimes you know too much or you're trying to, uh, I've done a number of works that are updates on classic or iconic pieces. Um, one I did uh, was uh, speculation on the birth of the Alessi teapot, mm. which was in a show in, in Portland, um, probably in the nineties. <clears throat> and it got reviewed um, out of the show for being a horrible statement that I'm taking apart or making a comment on the Alessi teapot, which was, <laughs> very iconic back then. And, um, but part of the, the, ref the art historical reference in there is that I had wanted to be a, a silversmith. And when Michael Graves decided to design these teapots, he, one avenue of it was to enlist a whole slew of silversmiths in Italy <laughs> to make them for him um, beautifully. <clears throat> and professionally and all of that at a cost, at a cost that I couldn't possibly um, compete with. And then he, he used the similar forms. Uh, I mean, he's a great architect, but he was doing design um, into, um, I suppose they're aluminum or steel um, and having them mass produced. So I took elements of his and I carved a bird that was for the, the, the top and I put it in a frame, which starts to, to bring in art historical sourcing of uh, how they thought uh, art, artistic achievement came down through birds, for instance. There's a little set of little flock of birds underneath bringing this divine um, inspiration through a human. <laughs> because in the, just slightly before the Renaissance, they didn't understand how art happened and how it got into certain people. Um, so anyway, I have references through, throughout this piece, and I've done a number of those with different iconic pieces um, every now and then when it fancies me, I guess, or I have something to say about the field or something like that. 
Um, so yeah. I do, yeah. Layer, <laughs> layer that in there as a added bonus. I've always liked in my three-dimensional work that as someone walked around a sculpture, they could still discover more things. It's not just a one shot. I can see it from here and I know everything about it that I want to or need to. Um, I like them discovering the little things around it that might not be what they expect. So it's partly that same sort of thing, but it might be layered in a different way um, yeah. art historically. Yeah, I did that about 10 years after my graduate, uh, my MFA, I went back and studied art history from a true art history uh, department. So therefore I was on probation <laughs> because I was a maker and they didn't believe makers could really do art history. So, but I spent then the, the decade uh, writing reviews and articles for Metal Smith and um, bringing out the voice of the makers themselves, what they put into the work, rather than looking at the work and coming up with what that must be about. So I thought it was a different take on how to do art history at the time. I, I think that's becoming more respected, that kind of approach. And there, there was so little of that um, in your generation and my generation. And over time, um, I'm, I'm seeing more and more come out from they that. Were just, they were just starting to invite or allow um, people from other fields, whether it was psychology, um, there are just other fields that were also looking at art history. They were looking at the, the time that that artist lived in or that culture or that society and things like that. And my first thesis had everything to do with the culture that made it. Looking at that, I worked backwards <laughs> in that. I, uh, it was a very fun process of, of uh, finding an object that I, I really responded to, going to the museum that had it and requesting to be shown that piece. And then I would make sketches of it and then research its, its history of making and history of uh, pro, uh, supporting that particular work. Pillow pots, for instance, um, Central and, and uh, uh, Northern South America, um, things like that were just fun to do. And museums let me go in and do it. It was, it was fabulous. But it was just beginning to, to uh, brush into other fields and being informed. And it got, you know, our criticism and articles became deeper. So I'm, I'm glad it's more common. Yeah, like the book Makers came out, it was uh, written by Bruce Metcalf. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, oh, I'm losing her name. Uh, Janice, Janet Coplo. Yeah, yeah, that they wrote yeah. together, and Bruce is a maker. Mm -hmm. uh, she's an art critic. Anyway, it's just well, well Bruce. Bruce um, wrote a tremendous number of articles and reviews and books. So yeah, both writers. Yeah. Um, this might go in earlier, but um, on the the term essential and the works that are in the show, <laughs> um, the uh, there is some humor to to start with. There is a relationship piece in there called, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, Always a Journey. So that's sort of on the humorous side and I don't wanna give that away, but um, just look at it and try and figure that out as a puzzle. But there are, uh, when you talk about harvest and things um, like the American Peas at the museum, the work, two works in, in this show, Essential, do have to do with um, the preciousness of our food supply and GMO um, getting into our foods uh, through, through large um, production facilities you know, that have farms and whatnot. So both flick and risky gestures are, are about that. They're on the more serious side. Um, one problem I have with making, say, either political or other types of comments that are um, like a, about um, the preciousness of our, of our planet um, is that I still have a, a need to have a certain amount of elegance. So I, I think that when I've made the statements, they, they don't quite hit as hard as, as a lot of works might. Um, and so they might be missed in terms of what, they're, what I'm trying to say. But in Flick, you'll, you'll see a corn cob um, and a, a giant hand 
about to flick a kernel, basically. Those are kernels of corn, but it's a, a comment about GMOs in, in our corn, for instance. And a risky gesture is about our soy soybeans and production and how that was so unusual back, you know, not too far. Certainly in my lifetime, it was a very scoffed at sort of food source. And now it's it's really everywhere. They've really developed it. But as they've grown it in America, at least, they've they've also um, toyed with its chemistry. So it's not as pure as it used to be. And we probably need to be a little bit careful about that. So those are our works in uh, the essentials that have to do with on the more serious side of, of um, commentary. And then handful a day is just fun. It's about garlic. <laughs> Everyone needs more garlic. You know? yeah, to me, your work has this very kind of gentle quality when you look at it, the way that the light is kind of diffuse over the surface, but it really takes you know strength and pounding and force to, to shape it in the ways that you do. I also, there's that, but then they also have to be, be, be placed together in a way and joined. So almost, almost everything is hot joined, but some things are, are applied to it and secured in the back. But I used to use a phrase called with, with the, um, I do forming and fabricating, but with the, oh, I, I wish I had that phrase again, but with the uh, like intimate contact of jewelry, because I, I still feel like I make jewelry or mm -hmm. I like to put a jewelry type element in my pieces that take a little bit more um, fine work because I enjoy that and miss it. Um, but uh, I don't want to do only that because that would drive me crazy. I like the, the broader surfaces, but I do like the details. And that shows up, I think, as, as what you were talking about, the, some amount of elegance and um, softness. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, we're really excited to have you in our show coming up. It's a series of wall pieces with imagery related to harvest food and produce. And, and we're thrilled to have your work. It's, it's so unique, so, so individual in its voice and all your great experience and all that you do for the arts in general. Um, I want to recognize as well um, how much you've been a factor on Bainbridge Island in particular and being a founding member of the committee that ultimately formed Barn and then a founding member of the board once Barn was formed and uh, just community work for the arts that you've done has been tremendous as well. Um, so you, you give a lot and it's it's very appreciated here. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a very enjoyable couple of decades. <laughs> Be sure not to miss Essential, an exhibition centered around food, farms, and art with works by regional artists at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts from September 3rd through September 26th.